I want to thank everybody who has been praying for this ministry and being supportive. This is a great time of trial and prayer is the absolute best form of payment that I can receive from any of you. So please continue to keep me and my family in your prayers. I appreciate that. I also want to share that I've been regularly meeting on Zoom with a group of people mostly coming from this channel and we meet on Saturdays typically at 8 30 a.m. Easter Standard Time as well as Sundays at 6 p.m. Easter Standard Time and this is the best way I have to share the teachings and the revelations I have from the Lord as in these videos sometimes take very long time for me to do the editing and with that time I actually can go over extensively the teachings and the wisdom I receive from the Lord. I invite you to join these Zoom meetings and you can send me an email to join. We will do uh, several different types of meetings, mostly at teachings, but there's also prayers and some are specialized teachings like this one I'm going to be sharing here in a very simplified and summarized version on marriage. The Lord has asked me to do these teachings because the wisdom that I receive is not mine. I don't speak of my own merit. I simply, whatever I hear from the Holy Spirit, I share it with the world. This is because it's a time of tremendous deception. The simple message is that you don't need me, an evangelist, an apostle, a pastor, to teach you the Word of God. What you need is the 66 books, possibly the King James Version of the Bible, and read it for yourself, asking the Holy Spirit, as we are told in John 14, that will teach you all things. Then you can listen to any other pastor, teacher, or apostle and evangelist and understand if, if they're speaking the word of God. But again, as a reference, not as your guidance or your guide. So this teaching comes from the knowledge and wisdom the Lord gave me about Matthew 7, 7. And in Matthew 7, 7, we're told to ask so that we shall receive. But it is not an option. It is not a suggestion. Well, if you do ask, it would be a good idea. No, it's a commandment. The Lord is saying, ask. You must ask in order to receive. And what the Lord is asking us to ask is wisdom, knowledge, and the mysteries of the gospel. These can only be shown by the Holy Spirit. And so without doing a very long introduction, the idea is that the only way to know the truth is to ask the Holy Spirit. And some men of God and women of God do that. But other men and women simply go through their own understanding and their own reading, spending sometimes hundreds of hours for something that the Holy Spirit can teach in a much shorter time. Not because they're not intelligent, but because the only source of truth is the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to be sharing here is not something that you will hear mainstream. And my understanding is because most people who teach on the subject have not taken the time to ask the Holy Spirit and simply wait for the Holy Spirit to explain it. And I have done that. I've asked and wept and cried out to the Holy Spirit to explain to me this very important subject, which is sending many, many believers to hell. And so I'm here just to share this wisdom and want you to go back on your own to the Word of God and to the Holy Spirit to confirm this message. So please listen, take notes, and go back to the Holy Spirit in Scripture for confirmation. When we talk about marriage, nothing can be understood unless we understood why and how God established a relationship between a man and a woman. This is not a general idea of what the world tells us a man and a woman should be. In fact, it's the complete opposite. The biggest problem that I've seen in others teaching on the subject is that they completely ignore what God tells us a man is and a woman is when they are in a relationship of husband and wife. Without this knowledge, we're wasting time and we're simply following doctrine of man and worldly ideas about what marriage should be 
in this particular day and age when we know there is a satanic agenda that's designed to promote a certain kind of equality and I don't mean in a sentimental way but in a certain kind of undifferentiated position of a man or a woman this is not what the Word of God says this does not mean that God does not love men and women equally as a matter of fact he teaches us to love one another and that includes men and women so it's not a sentimental position or a value position but it's a form of hierarchy a structure and order established by God so that things will work properly when we follow that order in order to understand this we're going to go to first Corinthians 11 verses 8 and 9 without these verses we are never going to understand the correct relationship between a man and a woman. In 1 Corinthians 11 verses 8, it says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. In verse 9, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. I invite you to study on your, on your own Genesis 3.12 and 2.18 to understand how was originally created a relationship with the woman is taken out of the man and taken back to the man. This is important because if we understand this, we're going to go to the worldly deception that Satan has created to destroy families and to make sure that we have rights that we don't have as either women or men so that the family can be broken and destroyed because the family is the symbolic representation of the union and love that exists exists in the godhead between the father the son and the holy ghost and it's replicated in the family structure and this is why satan hates this structure and he's making sure that there are deception in place within the church so the family can be broken so please understanding 1 Corinthians 11 verses 8 and 9 is the foundation on what we're going to be talking about next. What we have to understand is that Christ is the head of the church, is the husband marrying a bride, which is the church, not one woman, a church, which is us, a group of people which are married to Christ. Now, he does that through purchasing, buying us as the bride. This is, you can go in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Christ purchases, buys the bride at a price. Another example is in 2 Samuel 3, verse 14. And David sent messengers to Ish-bosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Michal, which I espouse to me, for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. This again testifies how David has purchased, bought his wife. Not so much as a house or a cow, but there is a sense and a, a legality of property where the husband buys, owns the wife. Now, this is not what the world teaches. And we don't care about the world. What we care is about the truth. This is not an ownership as in a car. It's a spiritual bond where two twain became one flesh. But that flesh is bought from the husband to the wife. It's a directionality that unless we understand, we can talk all we want, but we're not speaking from the Word of God. So now that we understand this, we can go to Ephesians 5 verses 23 and 24. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This is the relationship that's established by God. And he is the savior of the body. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Because it's a representation of the church being subject to Christ. In the same way that Christ gave his life for the church, his wife, then husbands are meant and supposed to give their lives for their wives. But this doesn't take away the title of ownership, the husband as over the wife. Without this, everything else in the gospel will not make sense. But with this understanding, it will be perfect sense. And in fact, there will be no contradiction between the Old Testament, the gospel, the words of the Lord, and the letters of Paul. So in order to understand the definition of anything according to God, 
we have to look at the Word of God, not what we think. And when we look at the Word of God, there are certain definitions, like for example, idolatry, that will be found in the Old Testament. Now, those apply then into the New Testament. We're just not defining them again in the New Testament because the Lord already defined them into the Old Testament. So if we want to know what adultery is, we have to go to the book of Leviticus. Not that we're under the law, but to understand what the law says and the definition of it. Without that, we can talk about adultery according to modern standards, but not according to the Word of God. So in the book of Leviticus, for example, you will notice if you go through every one of the verses, that's in addressed to either a man, a soul, every woman, everyone, or a woman. It's very specific verse by verse. For example, in Leviticus 20, verse 15, it says, And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. But then in verse 16, it says, And if a woman approach unto any beast, and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. So notice and understand that the Lord has two separate verses, one for the man and the beast, one for the woman and the beast. So it's very specific. Who is he talking to? And the definition is giving us for who is he speaking about. So when we go to Leviticus 20 verse 10, we read, And the man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. But notice it's talking about a man, not married or unmarried, we don't know, could be married or unmarried, going to another man's wife, taking her for himself, then this man, whether he's married or unmarried, doesn't matter, is an adulterer, and the wife is the adulteress. Notice and understand that it's very different from the modern concept of adultery. What we're saying is the wife is property of the husband, and another man, who is not her husband, goes and steals her, takes her from the husband. He's committing a sin against God, first of all, and he's committing a sin against the other man's, the other, the other man, the wife belonging to the other man. Whether he's married or unmarried is irrelevant. There is no mention of his wife, or if he's unmarried, there is a mention of the other man's wife. And we know this because we know one person who did that in the Bible.